The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer greatly from the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. Then Peter took Jesus <coughs> and began to rebuke him. God forbid it for him. No such thing shall ever happen to you. He turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an obstacle to me. You are thinking not as God does, but as human beings do. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wishes to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What profit would there be for one to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? Or what can one give in exchange for his life? For the Son of Man will come with his angels in his Father's glory, and then he will repay all according to his conduct. The Gospel of the Lord. Normally, Jesus was very placid. He was not given to anger. But there, there are some exceptions. One of them is today where he was very upset with Peter. In fact, he called him Satan. Which would be a terrible thing to call somebody. So, without any good reason for it, what does this mean? Basically, he's telling Peter that Peter was trying to do the devil's bidding and trying to talk Jesus out of going to Jerusalem where he would suffer, offer his life for the world. Peter had other ideas. He was thinking along the lines of the world. What should the Messiah do? According to the mind of the world, perhaps demand armies, invade Rome, or at least reject the Roman occupying forces. Use your power and do something, make something of yourself. Get into public office, be a king, dominate people, bring back what we lost of King David, all of these things. They're things that are based on worldly understandings of how to change the world. Jesus came to change the world at a deep level, at the level of spirituality, morality, forgiveness, to do something about the death. But Peter didn't understand this. When Jesus started his public ministry, there was the same temptation. The devil suggested to him that he turned stones into bread. In other words, why don't you bother, or rather, rather why, why do what the Father wants you to do when you can do a great good for the world by simply feeding people. So this was a recurrent temptation in Jesus' life to do things that weren't necessarily bad things. In fact, feeding people was not a bad thing at all. But to be distracted from his mission from his father, which ultimately meant 
and you have to offer his life to the world. The devil is afraid of the cross very much and flees from it. The Second Vatican Council renewed the, uh, or revised all of the rights of the church, and the last one to be revised was the right of exorcism. And there is a public right of exorcism, the center, the center of which is the invocation of the power of the cross, because evil spirits flee. The sign of the cross is powerful. People can use it, should use it. I, I would hope everybody makes the sign of the cross a number of times throughout the day with devotion and with an understanding of its power, its spiritual power. The Mass itself is the representation of the cross of Jesus. The devil does not like the Mass for that reason. In fact, Harvard University was going to schedule a Black Mass. A black Mass is a satanic mockery of the Catholic Mass. The Catholic population of that area was up in arms about it, and finally the president of the university gave in and blocked this terrible aberration from taking place. Satan, of course, is difficult, it can be very difficult. He will find an opening wherever there is one. So, Oklahoma City, Pacific Center, planning to have a black mass next month. And the local archbishop, of course, pulled out all of the stops, tried to deter this from taking place. So after every Mass, the Archbishop called for a special prayer to St. Michael the Archangel in the Sunday's of Battle, the protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. Many of you know the prayer. Pray it regularly. He also called for a Eucharist, Eucharistic exposition, for people to pray before the Eucharist, pleading with the Lord not to let this terrible aberration take place. Then, perhaps a moment of inspiration beyond these things, Archdiocese sued the group of devil worshippers sponsoring the Black Mass. And on the grounds that for a Black Mass to take place, people who perpetrated steal a consecrated host from the Catholic Church. They defile the host. So the Archdiocese went to court to sue this group for stealing church property because the church claimed to have consecrated host. Interestingly enough, the group returned the host. The Black Mass has not been canceled, to my knowledge. I, I'm going to ask people here to continue to pray. This thing does not take place. It's a crude mockery of the Catholic Mass. And it isn't, it's not merely a matter of people who don't like the church. It's really diabolical in origin. The devil knows what the Mass is. In fact, in fact, Jesus made some reference to the devil being conquered in connection with the Last Supper. The Mass is the real thing. It's not just a symbol of what we believe. It's not simply a ceremonial reenactment of the Last Supper, but it does make the cross of Jesus and his sacrifice present for us in an unbloody form. It's nonetheless real. We have to remember that. The devil, of course, does corrupt people. He doesn't corrupt everyone, but he'll try to do whatever he can do. Catholics, we have the sacrament of penance, or confession. The priest uh, named John Vianney, who was a canonized saint, used to be molested by Satan every, almost every night in his rectory room. And he knew that when it was particularly rough, that in the next day in the confessional there would be a great conversion. And it happened every time. So he was very 
unmoved by the devil's tactics because he knew the devil was upset. What upsets the devil more than anything is holiness. It's important for us to keep the call to be holy. A person commits a mortal sin. A person is not holy. It's the worst state to be in. You should never take that for granted. A mortal sin means a person is really separating himself from God. Sometimes people say, well, I don't, how can you believe in a God who sends people to hell? You know, he doesn't send anybody to hell. People to do it to themselves. That's the problem. That's self-imposed. It's self-imposed exile from God, which starts in this world. As long as a person persists in mortal sin, if he dies in that state, he'll never see God. He'll never be happy. Through his own choosing. It's not what God wants. Remember, he sent his son that we might have eternal life. He wants what's best for us. But he doesn't force anybody to be saved. He just doesn't force people. That wouldn't be right. He respects what he made. He made us. He respects our dignity as free agents, free responsible agents. But we must use our freedoms wisely. The world has a great influence on people. One of the heart aches for me as a priest, and I, I, I would think probably for many other people, is the widespread practice of people living together who are not married to each other, the call of ask to be married and so forth, and the priest finds out they're not in a good situation, talks to the people. Is it necessary to live together before you're married? The answer is, this practice is really is not of God. It's a direct violation of the commandments. St. Paul said, fornicators will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's in the New Testament many times. We must urge people to live the way they should live. The sad thing is that people claim to be Catholics who are living like pagans. And I, I say this with all due respect, but it's true. The prince of the world is the devil. That's one of his titles. Whenever something is popular with the world, when it comes to morality or faith, let's say, there's a very good chance it's not consistent with the gospel of God. This is given to us in 1 John 4 when it talks about testing the spirits. Test all spirits. There are many unholy spirits in the world who are vying for our attention. They want to influence people. They mostly work through temptation. They don't work through bondage or possession very often, but through tempting people. And a temptation is a lie that's dressed up to look good. Otherwise, a temptation will have no force. If we can cut through the attractive dressing of a temptation, we will find out just how ugly it is. How ugly it is because it's a lie. The best way to fight temptation is to unmask the lie. We must do that. Satan is the father of lies. This is something to think about. It is very important for us to pray. You know, in hell, nobody prays. That's why it's hell. Nobody prays. No one wants anything to do with God. We must be open to God. If we're not open to God, there will be a void there. Something will fill. I would urge people to pray every day, one hour a day. Father, that's not realistic. Let me tell you, Holy Father prays, it's a busy schedule, Pope John Paul II prayed, many, many hours a day, I'm sure. And I will tell you, the person prays for one hour is probably praying for 20 minutes because it may take him 20 minutes to calm down. But pray, if you give an hour, maybe it's not one solid hour's worth. If you give an hour's worth of prayer, this will be a, go a long way toward fighting the devil, fighting evil spirits, keeping us true to what we are about. 
The devil wants to distract us in so many ways. Our own vocation, for example, the devil doesn't want us to follow or be true to. The seminary, which is in Wycliffe, uh, the intersection of 271 and 90, you go into the seminary building, you see pictures of ordination classes, graduate, graduating classes of seminarians who went on to be ordained and so forth. Well, if you go back to 1968 or 69, right around that time, the classes are decimated. Decimated because priests left the priesthood, many of them, not all of them, about half of them did, in those particular classes. And why did they leave the priesthood? Because a priest is a weak man who can be corrupted if he's not careful. But different things. So I'm urging people, uh, some, some of you do it already, to pray for priests. If you're wondering what to pray for, you spend your time before God. That's a big one. Pray for priests. Very important. The devil would like to see every priest corrupted. Doesn't like them because the priest makes present Jesus' body and blood, absolves people from their sins. The devil doesn't like that. He wants people to live in sin. doesn't believe in the mass. Many people are called to marriage. Marriage is a vocation. Today, the divorce rate is 50% in the U.S. This is the highest divorce rate in the history of the world anywhere. We haven't really begun, or maybe we have begun to feel the fallout from this. It's a tragedy. It's really a disaster. What is needed? We need Jesus in the center of every marriage. We need him there. We need Jesus in the center of marriage. We need Jesus in the center of anybody's vocation. Adam and Eve were the first couple. But well, there was a snake in the garden. There's a snake in every garden. Don't let it get the better of you. 